I'm ready to jump into week two of Did You Get My Text? Did You Get My Text? It's just a series um, creatively titled in a way that we know, I, I, I said in the first, uh, or rather last week, to a humorous extent, when you have missed someone's text or if, when you have misunderstood someone's text, how many of you know it changes the meaning of things? Sometimes you're a little lost. Sometimes you're a little confused. Sometimes you believe in the wrong thing. And I believe that sometimes God is saying, I, I sent you a text message. Did you get my text? I just want to make sure that there's no confusion on the text I sent you because my words are life. My words are truth. My words, my words are the pathway to life. And, and I want you to walk in the light as I am in the light. And so I wonder sometimes if God's not up there going, did you get my text? And it's okay if you missed it for a season, but it's not okay to miss it for your whole lifetime. You, I, I have a text for you and I want you to receive. And that's what this series is all about. It's just um, talking about some pivotal texts that make a transformative difference that we can't just be hearers of the word, but we actually have to be transformed by the word. And so my prayer for you is as we get into his word today, that some part of you, if not a big part of you, is transformed by his words today. If you agree with that, say amen. I believe God wants to go uh, do some work and lovingly uh, shape us even more into his image. So let's do this. How far will bees travel to follow their queen? Well, a lot further than you might think. Because in 2016, I remember coming across an article that was a little hard to believe. And when I read the headline, I didn't think it was true until I show you a picture in just a few minutes. But I'm not going to show it to you yet. Because 20,000 workmen bees followed a Highlander SUV for two days. <laughs> the, the, a woman who owned the SUV went in, it lived in the country of Wales, and they went to a nature reserve. And when she was leaving, she noticed a swarm of bees following her, so she did what any sane human being would do. She hit the gas. Come on. She, she took off. But she noticed midway through her journey that cars all of around her were slowing down. Some people were hanging out to take pictures of her car. And when she parked the car, she had to see what everyone else saw, she saw this. 20,000 bees had been following her SUV because um, a, a beekeeper showed up and, and, and to take care of the situation. And so he did his best to gather them all up. And, and, and he reported he got stung a few times in the, in the process too. And he removed them into a different location. Only for the car to be found the very next day by 20,000 bees again. In the same corner. So the beekeeper comes back and this time he closely investigated and found that the queen bee had been lodged somewhere stuck on the, uh, on the back rear window, some sort of crevice. She must have been attracted to something in the car when it was in the nature reserve. Got stuck and her bees followed her. Now here's my question for us today. If 20,000 bees will relentlessly follow their queen for miles over the course of many days, how far should we follow our king? Come on. Now, I think nature is telling a little bit of a story here that if they will go through obstacles, if they'll go through situations, if they'll travel distances, if they're willing to follow their queen, how much more should we follow the king of kings as our worship team sang that song this morning because Jesus has done infinitely more than any queen bee has done for their, her, their, their hive. Come on. I've, I've done a little of the studies. That that queen ain't doing jack. Come on. She's just chilling up in there, you know. She's just got her little royal scepter and her little crown. And she says, serve me, serve. Okay, anyway. This is where I recommend the B movie. It's great. Come on. <laughs> our, our oldest daughter got hooked on that. I was like, praise God she got hooked on a funny one. Because I, I know all the stories, why, all the quotes. Why does yogurt night have to be so difficult? John 21. <laughs> John 21, the last chapter of our gospel, that means the four books of the Bible that were written about Jesus' time on earth. In John chapter 21, it describes Jesus 
after the crucifixion. He's been crucified. Uh, he's died. Uh, uh, thousands of eyewitnesses watched him die. They took his body down, put him in a grave. Three days later, he busted loose. I feel like busting loose, y'all. I feel like busting loose. He was listening to that track as he came out. Only later would we get a revelation to sing that song. I feel like busting loose. I don't know if it resonates or not. Don't hold me to that. That's where the metaphor ends, okay? It was a joke. Anyway, <laughs> bonk, bonk, I feel like bu Okay, anyway, some of y'all were dancing that last night. Come on. <laughs> Listen, he comes, he, he's resurrected, and he, he comes back, he appears to so many people in his post-resurrection body that thousands saw him and met with him in various locations. One of the final things he does is he goes to meet with Peter, who uh, Peter had told Jesus right before he died, listen, where are you going to your grave? I, over my dead body. Come on, they'll have to take me out first. Come on, hey, I will be standing in their way. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And he ended up, he said, you'll deny me three times. And we know that he acted all chesty about his faith. Come on, I, I will, uh, come on, ride or die, baby. Come on, I'm with you, Jesus, only until a little sermon servant girl by a bonfire says didn't I see you rolling with him and he goes no and the Bible says he cussed and he swore he wasn't with Jesus so he denied him feeling like a failure feeling guilty feeling with his head hung so Jesus decides to reappear in his post-resurrected body to Peter and he asks him to follow him and to feed his sheep and this is what happens in John 21 it says I tell you for certain Peter that when you were a young man you dressed yourself and you went wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, you will hold out your hands. Then others will wrap your belt around you and lead you where you don't want to go. And Jesus had said this to tell uh, how Peter would die and bring honor to God. So Peter, th then he says to Peter, follow me. In other words, it's almost like Jesus is saying there will be a lot of different distractions for you to not live out the calling I have on your life. So he says, follow me. Like, like listen to me, Peter. You're going to have to follow me, all right? So Peter responds. He turns and he saw Jesus' favorite disciple following them. And he said, when Peter saw this disciple, he asked Jesus, Lord, what about him? <laughs> What's he going to do? And Jesus answered, what is it to you if I want him to live until I return? As for you, and here's our text message again today, follow me. This, this morning, I want to preach a message simply entitled, Did You Get My Text? Follow Me. Pray with me. Father, I pray that you would speak to us, speak your words of life. Our hearts are open. Our ears are open. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That word, follow me. Two words put together in a potent sentence that changes so much. It changes everything. In fact, um, uh, follow me means three different things. I want you to take notes today because I have a lot to share with you that I believe something's going to touch your life in some way or the other. Number one, follow me is a call to quit comparing. Follow me is a call to quit comparing. We live so much of our life with our eyes fixed on everybody else. Our eyes fixed on our bank account. Our eyes fixed on our enemies. Our eyes fixed on people who slighted us. Our eyes fixed on our competition. Our eyes fixed on those who are prettier than me, got more money than me, uh, funnier than me, uh, seemingly more happy than me. Come on. We have our eyes on a lot of different things. And when Jesus speaks to Peter to follow me, he's saying, I, 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 don't worry about John. Get your eyes off of them. You need to not listen to the voices all around you. You're going to have to focus, and you're going to have to follow me. Your calling's unique. You're going to have to follow me. Quit comparing to everybody else. But let's see how Peter responds to Jesus. I, I didn't read every verse that was right there. Let me read the ones that I skipped. It says, when Jesus told Peter, you're, in essence, he was saying, you're going to be a martyr. You're going to have to give your life up for the message of me. So Peter does what many of us would do. What about him? <laughs> like, what's his fate? Could you share his fate with mine? Maybe we can swap them and never tell him. <laughs> he can do the dying, <laughs> and I'll do a lot more preaching. I'll write more. 
Come on, I'll be a missionary. <laughs> Come on, listen. <laughs> no, Peter says, Peter turned and saw Jesus' favorite disciple following him. Can I remind you that the words you're about to read are written by John <laughs> describing his situation when Jesus talks to him. I believe there's a little sarcasm in his voice. Like, I don't even want to mention his name. <laughs> Jesus' favorite disciple, you know the little brown noser? that You know, when Jesus says, follow me, the one who's following him up his backside, come on, listen. He says, he says, <laughs> I turned and I saw Jesus' favorite disciple. There he is again. Can't get away with him. Can't get away from him. Can't get a moment with Jesus alone. He's telling me my destiny. And here he is, favorite guy, just leading in. I'm going to tell you a little more about him. John gets his pen out. He was the same one who sat next to Jesus on the final last supper. We all had assigned seats. He could have picked any one of them. He's the one who had to sit right next to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, I got the seat right next to you. Can I serve you? Can you reach the bowl? I'll get you the hummus. Come on. Anybody need any pita bread? Come on. He, he, he's the one who sat next to him. King James Version says he's the one who laid his head on his breast. <laughs> Come on now. I'm trying to eat my pita bread, and his brother's over here. Jesus, can I lis listen to your heartbeat one more moment? Peter's just like, stinking. This is how the Last Supper's going down. I got to deal with this mess. He's the same one who sat next to Jesus. And he asked, Lord, who's going to betray you? And when Peter saw this disciple, I won't even use his name. His name disgusts me. Come on. He asked Jesus, Lord, what about him? In other words, he is full of comparisons. Like, is he going to get a better deal than me? <laughs> Did I draw the short end of the stick? Come on. Uh, what is my fate? And Jesus answered, what is it to you if I want him uh, to live until I return? As for you, follow me. As if to say, so what if I do blank for them? You follow me. And we got to live this out too. The, the call, follow me. The text message, follow me is a call to quit comparing yourselves to they got further faster. Come on. They got more of an opportunity. They got a platform position and I got a behind the scenes position. Uh, they get more recognition. They got affirmation. They got approval. They got this opportunity. They got more talents than me. They got more skills than me. How come I didn't get this? And Jesus is like saying, Peter, never mind what I want to do with this brother. You Follow me. It's like taking your little kids and just going, I'm trying to speak something. Can we lock in here? You're going to have to follow me. Not them. <laughs> Sometimes our littlest girls get into a fight and you're just like, why did you do that? Because they, because they, I'm not talking about them. Let's lock back in. <laughs> why, why did you? And they're like this. Come on. You're like, why did you? And they're like, because they. And she's like, no. <laughs> follow me here. I'm trying to have a conversation with you. I sometimes wonder if Jesus is just not saying, hey, Peter, yes, <laughs> follow me. Keep your eyes fixed on me. Quit comparing yourself to them. So what if I want to do X, Y, or Z to them? In fact, I wrote it this way. When we begin following him, we quit following them. When we begin following him, we quit following them. We lose track of it, and honestly... If we're real with ourselves, comparing ourselves to others is our way of seeing if God has shafted us or not. It's really a lack of faith. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, a body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. If foot says, I'm not elegant like hand, embellished with rings, I guess I don't belong to this body, would that make it so? If ear says, I'm not beautiful like I, transparent and expressive, I don't deserve a place on the head. Would you want to remove it from the body? If the body was all eye, how could it hear? If it was all ear, how could it smell? As it is, we see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. So let's stop comparing ourselves to other parts of the body. Come on. Theodore Roosevelt said, comparison is the thief 
of joy. And we got to stop going, but what about John? What is John going to get to do? Is he going to do something better? Is he going to get a bigger platform than me? Is he going to sit next to you as he enters into the kingdom of God like at the Last Supper? He took the seat. You know, I wanted to see too. Jesus is saying, so what about them? Just follow me. See, this is where faith changes everything. Because faith says, I am confident that God has something significant for me too. The natural world thinks, if they got it, I don't. If they got him, I won't. If they got this, then I miss out. Faith says, I am confident. Put up Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. In other words, my faith says I can celebrate them now because God's not shafted me. He's got big plans for me too. Great are the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for a hope and for a future. I knew you when I knit you together in your mother's womb. I have not forsaken you. I have not abandoned you. They might seem seemingly ahead. You might be a late bloomer. It's not like God has not given you a purpose. Let's quit complaining. Comparing ourselves to them. Follow me. So what if they got more shares on social media? Follow me. So what if they got married before you? Follow me. I've got big plans for you. In fact, write this down. Trying to live someone else's life guarantees you'll never live yours. In fact, I think it's one of the greatest tricks of the devil that if I could get you trying to be me and me trying to be you, both of us live jacked up because we will never fulfill our God-given purpose, which will inevitably make heaven bigger and hell smaller. So what, he what Satan wants to do is start trying to tell you, don't you wish you were like them? God's trying to hold out on you. That's the same M.O. he used in the Garden of Eden when he said, God just doesn't want you to be as smart as he is. See, if you'd have some fruit, you'd catch up. I was just like God saying, just keep your eyes on me. Don't listen to the other voices. Number two, follow me is a call to a new thing. When Jesus says, follow me, he is calling you to a brand new thing. And some of us are scared of new things, but some of us know, I jacked up the old thing. I wrecked the old thing. It'd be, it'd be like this. If you borrowed my car and you dinged it up and you messed it up and you jacked it up and you ran it out of gas and got the motor all jacked up and then you knew you had to turn it back into me, you'd be going, I would happily trade the old thing if somebody would offer me a new thing so that I could get give it back right in the same way we many of us know that I'm living with shame and regret and I the call to follow me is an opportunity to leave the old thing for a new thing can I get an amen, amen. Mark chapter 2 says who would patch old clothing with new cloth for the new patch would shrink and jack up the old cloth it would rip it away leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the wine would burst the wineskin, and the wine and the skins would both be, say this next word with me, lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. And when Jesus says, follow me, it is an invitation to stop following the things you have been following and to follow him. We have all followed something before in this life. Guys, girls, gold, glory, good times. I believe we need to trade in those lowercase g's for the capital G, the OG, the kingdom of the, the, our, our King Jesus Christ, who is God. Come on, somebody give him some praise right now. I have served all those other G's before. I have chased them before. You probably have too. Until I traded him to, and followed him for a new Lord. And my mantra became, he must increase, I must decrease. This is a new thing, y'all. All of our life we have lived for, I must increase. I must increase my followers. I must increase my income. I must increase my influence. I must increase my degree. I must increase uh, my reputation. I must increase my, my popularity. I must increase. I must increase. This is leaving that behind to say, I don't really need to increase anymore. In fact, I need to lower. And he must increase. Fun fact, if you didn't know it, that's why Lift Church has a lowercase i. 
in its logo. It's not to be cute or gimmicky. It's a constant reminder that if we will stay small, he'll lift up everything else. So we lift him up while we stay small. Humble ourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. So under point number two, I want to give you three ways that you can be new. New in three ways. So this is 2A, okay? Uh, uh, um, A is it's a call to leave your cares for his cares. Like when Jesus calls Peter for the first time, he says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. What he's saying is, you have fished for fish before. That's your concern. You're worried about filling up your tummy. You're worried about taking care of your family. You're worried about where the next meal comes from. I want to give you a greater purpose. Leave your concerns for my concerns. And my concerns are, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Because God says he is not slow in coming back again, for he is patiently waiting because he does not desire not one son or daughter that he has created in his image to perish or have eternal life in hell, for he wants all of them to enter into the kingdom of heaven, receive their prize, enter those pearly gates, and hear, well done, my good and faithful son or daughter. And therefore he says, you have your concerns, putting food on the table, gaining your reputation, making sure you marry the right person, blah, blah, blah. Leave those and I'm going to make you concerned with my concerns. I'll take care of your concerns in the process, but I'm calling you to live for something bigger than yourself. I, I can remember when I gave uh, my life to Christ, I, um, I was concerned, and so this is honest transparency, I was concerned with making money, building my reputation, and trying to find the girl that I was going to marry one day. These were my concerns. At 20 years old, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And I remember losing the concern of money. <laughs> uh, my, my first degree is in uh, a, a bachelor's in business management from LSU, Louisiana State University. And I have used that degree this much because the Lord called me. <laughs> to the ministry in my junior year and I praise God in my case that I never experienced the financial income of that degree because I might not have lived out my calling I would have lived for my cares instead of living for what he has cared about in my case I needed to lose the the, the chase of money I lived for my reputation I was in a touring band. We worked hard to build it from nothing to something. The day we got called to fly across the, the country and play in Indianapolis for Butler University on the very court they shot Hoosiers, I thought I was big stuff. And it was like, come on, baby, MTV, here we come. Come on, come on. We're going to be on all the TV stations. I'm going to work my way on BET. I don't know how. I'm going to get there. <laughs> listen, listen. It's about my reputation. But I remember the day I laid down my life of Christ. I just remembered my reputation didn't matter so much. Everything I had built, I was no longer interested in building my kingdom because I had a desire to build the kingdom of the one who saved me. And then I was chasing after girls, trying to find the right one because I better do it and hurry up before somebody else gets the good one. And, and what if they call this and that or the other? And I just remember giving my life to Christ and saying, I'm no longer going to chase that God. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You'll take care of the rest. I'm no longer going to live prisoner to I have to be in a relationship like I have learned all of my high school and middle school years. Therefore, I'm content with just you, God. At the right time, you do it. And I remember God bringing my wife into my life a, a, a few months after that as if God was saying, I just need you to get comfortable with me and me alone. That I'm enough. That I'm enough. So when he says, Follow me, he's saying, leave your cares for his cares. When Jesus called various people to follow him, they gave him all kinds of excuses. I got a funeral, farming, just married Prince Charming. Can't come yet. I'll catch up afterward. Jesus said, don't worry about those concerns. Follow me. To be is, it's an invitation to live for something more. I started talking about this a little bit. The newness is the invitation to live to, for something more. Have you ever gotten to a point before where you thought, is this it? Is this all life is? Like, wake up, go to work, put food on the table, go back to sleep, start it all over again, 
Is this it? Is this why I was created? Or you thought, come on, wake up, change the diaper, put mush into the mouth, <laughs> keep them alive, <laughs> put them to sleep, hope they don't wake up too soon, do it all over again. Is this the purpose of life? And the answer is it's time to go up higher. It's time to be called something bigger. God created you on purpose with a purpose. And sometimes we get caught in that Groundhog's Day loop where we're just like, I'm Bill Murray, and I'm just wondering <laughs> what is the point of this all? And we got to realize, come on, some of y'all didn't get it. You're going to help other people out. <laughs> come on, Groundhog Day. All right, sort of funny, I think. Anyway, so just your opinion. Anyway, God wants to enlarge our visions. He says, if your way is as high as it gets, you're cutting yourself short. For my ways are higher than your ways. They're higher than anything you could dream, think of, or imagine. And when I tell you follow me, I'm calling you to greater than any lavish thing you have ever thought about for your life. I've got more purpose for you than you've got for yourself. Follow me. When he said follow me, it was a call to something more. And then finally, to see, the, the, the third way that it's a new thing is it's an invitation to new companionship. Um, there are three types of companionship. Number one, we get the companionship of all companionship. The divine accompaniment of God himself in our presence. I love the way the two men on the road to Emmaus described it in Luke 24 when they said, weren't our hearts burning in us when we found out we were walking with him? Like I remembered, life was different on the road with him than on the road by myself or just with you. And they were like, what do you mean? Come on, man. Like, no, it's just you're great. He was better. I got a divine accompaniment. So it's a call to new, um, new companionship with divine accompaniment, number one. Number two, leaving old companionships. So when Jesus said, follow me, in today's time, if Jesus walked up to you and said, hey, follow me, we would just go, yeah, no problem. I don't mind. Give me your, give me your tag handle. <laughs> I'll follow you. In other words, you'll be one of the many voices I pay attention to. I'm not going to change very much in my life. I'll just read your words more often. Um, I'll let you be a word for today, among many other words for today. When Jesus said, follow me, there was no technology. He meant, if I'm going to follow you, and I'm Peter in this boat, I'm going to leave this boat. I'm going to leave this occupation. I'm going to leave the pub that I always hang out with tonight. I'm going to leave, leave my typical behaviors. I'm going to leave the typical people I hang out with because I'm no longer in Capernaum. We, we, we going all the way over here to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. In other words, follow me meant leaving things. And, and sometimes I worry in 2022 Christianity that we think Christianity is adding Jesus on top of what you do. But that's not what he meant when he said, follow me. It wasn't a, will you add me as one of the voices in your life? It was, will you put down all other voices in your life, all your other concerns, and follow me and trust that I've got greater things for you on this side. But you've got to trust me. And that means some of you need to leave some of the old companionship. The Bible says, bad company will corrupt good character. Come on. The Bible's very clear that when you, in Proverbs, that if you want to be wise, you must walk with the wise, and fools hang out with fools. So he's saying, follow me out of that group. Follow me out of those places. Follow me out of those life behaviors. Follow me out of those hangout spots. And relocate. For Peter, it was a boat. It could have been his evening plans. It was the boys he ran with afterward. For you, it might be something similar or something different. But you know when you're like, hey, I've tried to follow him and hold on to certain things and it ain't working. This is the Holy Spirit saying, ding, 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 follow me. Leave those old things. i got big plans for you, says the Lord. You can trust me. I'm for you, not against you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I won't abandon you and I won't lead you wrong got purpose for you follow me listen the, the the final companionship is not just leaving bad influences but it's gaining the best one and that is gaining new family i remember oh um 
last weekend was my 20-year born-again birthday. Come on. I gave my life to Christ 20 years ago and one week today. And I remember sort of um, uh, being blessed, knowing I was forgiven of my sins, knowing I made the best decision, but I knew my lifestyle wouldn't work with him anymore. I had to leave my five best friends I was touring with. I had to leave the lifestyle of helping people get intoxicated and do other sinful things, adulterous things, uh, uh, immoral relationships. I had to leave all of that because I felt God calling me out of it, and, and, and I just began to, to seek his way now. And I remember kind of complaining in that first year and I remember praying something like this God you've asked me to give up a lot I gave up my five best friends gave up my world and good for me I was complaining in church because I remember running sound <laughs> I was running sound in, in the church and I remember the soundboard being in the back room and God said hey look up look at all the family you gained in replacement and I started realizing I gave up five and I, gave, and I gained 1,005 family members. Like, I was thinking too much of woe is me and not realizing that God put the people in your row to grow along with you and to be an asset to you on your spiritual journey because you're not called to do Christianity alone. Come on, pound it with your neighbor and say, we're, we're not supposed to do it alone. Tell, tell your other neighbor, I need you too. Come on, and that's why in two weeks from now, we will have Small Group Sunday, and you need to sign up for a small group. If you're like, I don't love those things, I've tried that, I'm asking you to lean into it. Why? Because you were never called to do Christianity alone. And we grow best in, in relationships. We aren't always transformed best in rows, but more in circles. We, we say in small groups, it's a place to connect. It's where we get each other's names. The movie theater is not very conducive to doing that. It's a place that we protect. In other words, now I want to know your prayer requests, and I'd love for you to be praying for me too. I, 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 I can now protect your kids because I know them by name now. I can begin to pray over your marriage, and I can protect that. I can pray over your work situation because I know that. Listen, it's a place to connect, protect, and grow further with God. And so you need to sign up for a small group in two weeks. We will offer that. Romans eleven seventeen. Use an agricultural metaphor when Jesus said, You, though you were a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others. And now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, which meant you left the old companionship, you got divine ac accompaniment, and you've got a family to belong to. Somebody say amen. amen. And let me finish with the third way. Follow me speaks to us follow me as a call of restoration in Luke chapter 5 verse 27 Jesus calls Matthew a sinful tax collector to him and Jesus says later on as Jesus left the town he saw a tax collector with the usual reputation for cheating sitting at a tax collection booth the man's name was Levi we also know that to be Matthew and Jesus said to him come and follow me Follow me was an invitation to restoration. In other words, he was saying, Matthew, I know you're a sinner. Matthew, I know you're not perfect. Matthew, I know you've screwed up. Matthew, I know you've wandered down the wrong road in life. But I am still here speaking. Follow me. I send out the invitation irregardless of your reputation. And follow me means... It's not too far gone for you. There is still hope for you. I still want you. I still love you. I still desire you. I choose you a part of my family. Follow me. Follow me also means that when you start following me, you're going to hear of how I'm restoring you. He didn't invite Matthew to follow him so he could go, Now, Matthew, let's talk about how stupid you were back then. You've made some pretty dumb decisions. Let's try to count them all on two hands. As we walk together, let's just try to beat you over the coals. That's not what following him meant. Following him meant leave that. Leave all of that. Through me, if you'll follow me, I give you an invitation of restoration. All that the enemy has told you might be true, but it doesn't have to stay true. You have screwed up. 
you have wandered from my ways. You have not done perfect. But I sent my son, Jesus Christ, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And all who come to the Father must come through me. Follow me. I'm offering you a new, restored life. I'm here to tell you that everything the enemy told you you could never, God could never do for you is a lie. Because he's here, his Holy Spirit's here today saying, follow me. I'm wide-eyed and aware of your reputation. I know what happened even though you tried to hide it from me. I know what you said about them. I know what you felt about them. I still say, I want you. I'm going to restore you. And, and this doesn't have to define you. In fact, I think many of us know somebody who would love to be restored to God. They're wandering. Maybe they've been hurt by a church. Maybe they've never gone to church. Maybe they don't even know the message of Jesus Christ. But you are thinking, come on, if, you, if they would just hear the voice of Jesus saying, follow him, I believe so much could be changed, and they'd find the peace and the joy that I have. Come on, if you know somebody like that, we all know a number of people like that. God started dropping names on you. In two weeks, you might think, Pastor Drew, I don't know how to tell the message of this Bible as clear as you do. Well, then here's good news. I'm asking you to invite them in two weeks to what we're going to call Welcome Home Sunday, which is an intentional day where we will start a new series called Living the Dream. And there, who doesn't want to live the dream? And you just say, hey, I'm inviting you to my church on week one of Living the Dream. Come and hear. But I'm going to tell you that on week one of Living the Dream, we will preach the clearest, most concise message of how Jesus gave of his life to forgive your friends and family of their sin, shame, and regret. And hold it against them no longer, but give them newness and freedom of life. Come on and celebrate in advance for what God's going to do. Who do you know that the Spirit is prompting you? they got to be here that day. I'm encouraging you. Invite them to Welcome Home Sunday two weeks from now. Will you do that? Come on, look at your neighbor and say, we got homework. <laughs> I need to send that text message. Tell them, don't let me forget. <laughs> let me finish with one more tax collector. Jesus recorded his prayer, and the tax collector said this, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. In other words, you wouldn't want me, but please be merciful to me. In other words, I've screwed up. I'm not very good. I don't have much to offer, but would you be merciful to me? Jesus said about this person, I tell you, this sinner returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be lifted up, exalted, restored. Come on. He's saying those who will follow me, there is restoration in store for them. Amen. This is good news. I wrote it this way, guys. When you follow him, he begins restoring you to your pre-damaged state. Many of us fear, I've screwed it up too much. I'll never become what God had in mind. No, 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 no. The moment you follow him, he begins to restore you to your pre-damaged state. How many of y'all want that today? If you would, just open up your hands like you're going to receive something from heaven. I want to I want to I want to pray over over you. In fact, before we do that, you don't have to open your hands just yet. I just want to ask two altar calls and then a really big one. The first one is this. If you know that you need to surrender comparison, point number one, follow me means to surrender comparisons. If you know comparisons has been getting me down, my eyes have been all over the place. I've been looking at other women comparing. I've been looking at other men comparing. I've been looking at other social media accounts comparing. I've been looking at other vacations comparing. I've been looking at other people's lifestyles comparing. I've just been full of comparisons. If you're in this place, every head bowed, every eye closed, you just say, Pastor Drew, will you pray for me to get my comparison eyes off of that and just follow him? Just quickly throw your hand up. Yeah, so many, so many. Yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your courage and bravery. Come on, anyone online, you know, that hit home. Holy Spirit's talking to me. Yeah, we're going to pray for you. Here's the second thing I want to pray. If you've made the decision to follow Jesus already, you're on a journey with him already, but still, today, God was moving on your life to leave more of the old behind and to trust God with more faith that he's got significance and fullness for you too. 
If that's you today, I want to pray for your faith to be strengthened. That though we quit comparing, we will trust God has not shafted me. God's not forgotten about me. God's got big plans for me. I want to have a, an injection of faith, Pastor Drew, so that I can believe all the great things God believes about me. If that's you in this place, just real quickly say, that's me. Include me in that prayer. Yeah, I see hands, hands. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I see you. Thank you so many. Let's pray right now. Father. I thank you so much for those who said, hey, I got to get off of this comparison thing. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that the, the, the enemy's voice will be canceled. The one who tries to turn our head and the one who tries to distract us would be canceled. Let the enemy be exposed in your people's eyes so that they will see this was a bait of Satan. I will not compare myself. I will not, uh, uh, I will not rob from somebody else. I will not have low faith, uh, not believing that God's got big things for me too. I trust God. You will do it in your own time and you have not left me. You have not forsaken me you got big plans for me says the lord i, I trust you now father would uh, forgive me of my wandering eyes forgive me of my wandering ears i'm going to just trust you and follow you in jesus name for those who raise their hand to the second one and god you have delivered them from some of their old ways but your spirit has convicted some of us to go further it's time to to step into more, more holiness more purity more righteousness who may ascend the hill of the lord he with clean hands and a pure heart father would you clean our hearts would you would you clean our hands father those things that are not of you father we 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 choose to lay down more today because you are worthy of it all we give it to you. We give you our, our full affection and attention. Father, I pray over your people that we would have the strength to let go of things we've been gripping too tightly of. Father, when you told Jesus to leave the boat and follow you, he left the boat and he left the city. Father, help us leave bad company. Help us leave bad behaviors. Help us leave bad context bad hangout spots bad jokes bad talking help us leave those things so that we truly will be on your heels following you and not lagging behind in jesus name i pray amen before you lift your eyes before you lift your heads the most important question i can ask is are you right with god and if you are not right with god then there is there, there is an inner turmoil that goes on. I know the wrestling match too well. 20 years ago last week, I remembered God just moving on my heart. And I knew if I died today, I think I'm going to heaven. I'm not sure. There's a lot of things I hope God won't bring up. And I'm not sure if the good things I did outweigh the bad things I did. I'm not sure how he weighs these things. Well, let me be very clear to you that there's nowhere in the Bible that says you can be good enough to outweigh your bad things. I believe that lie because I believe the enemy wants you to believe it too because he wants your soul so that he can make, tick God off. But God in his infinite wisdom sent Jesus Christ down on earth to live a pure spotless life that anyone who believes in him will have eternal life. If you're in this place and you say, I want to give my life to him, whether it's for the first time, for the first time in a long time, or you just rededicate your life and you say, Pastor Drew, include me in that prayer. I'm giving my life to him and I'm leaving the old ways. Would you just throw your hand in the air? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anyone online? Let's all pray together, lift church out loud. We're going to pray along with you. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. Sinner and all, would you forgive me of my sins and every way I've fallen short? I give you all honor, praise. I believe Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for my sin's payment. Thank you, Jesus. I make you my Lord in life. I make you my Lord over my life all my days. In Jesus' name I pray. And the church said amen and amen.